Welcome to the Exploring Potential podcast, where we delve into the realm of unique and novel ideas within organizations. Join us as we uncover the driving force behind innovation and success by engaging in thought-provoking conversations and stories with some of the brightest minds in various fields. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Exploring Potential podcast. I'm your host, Brett King. If you know anything about me personally or about our companies, then you know how much incredible significance we place on company culture and its impact on business and on people. First of all, company culture exists whether you've made an intentional effort to develop it or not. If you don't make an effort, it defines itself and may not necessarily be what you had hoped for. When we're intentional about defining, building, and maintaining a strong and positive culture within our organizations, however, we can experience the many benefits that come along with that. For instance, companies with a strong culture enjoy greater ability to attract and retain top talent, more engaged and productive employees, greater customer satisfaction, and ultimately more profitability and longer-term success. In our work, we've seen all sides of the spectrum from an awful void of care through some of the absolute coolest companies that left us almost wishing we were working there instead. One of the strongest and coolest company cultures I've personally come across, both in the cinema space as well as other industries, is that at Warehouse Cinemas. Warehouse Cinemas is a Maryland-based theater chain that prides itself on providing guests authentic customer service with an elevated food and beverage menu, state-of-the-art projection and sound, and leather recliners. We're fortunate today to be joined by the president and CEO of Warehouse Cinemas, Rich Dautrich, who will help us understand how they got to where they are and what we can all take away from their lessons in building such a strong company culture. So Rich graduated from Smithsburg High School in 1994 and went on to attend the Virginia Military Institute, ultimately earning a degree in business and economics in 1998. While attending VMI, he played soccer and became the all-time scoring leader and is now a member of the VMI Sports Hall of Fame. After college, he played professional soccer for seven years. Rich is the current president and board member of the Independent Cinema Alliance, representing nearly 4,000 screens in the U.S., and also an advisory board member of the National Association of Theater Owners. He has also been a guest speaker and panelist at cinema trade events over the years, and Rich is currently the president and CEO of Warehouse Cinemas, and co-founder and CEO of High Rock, an accomplished and talented creative agency. He lives in Hagerstown, Maryland, with his wife, Susan, of 25 years and three children. Rich, welcome to the show. I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Yes, thank you for having me, Brett. It's good to be here. Awesome. We're going to have a great conversation today. Uh, Before we dive too far in, Rich, could you just kick us off with a quick background of your path to entrepreneurship and your companies and focus? Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, I graduated from college in 1998. Um, uh, I had an itch to continue playing soccer. I I did that for a couple years outdoor. Um, And I actually started a little business called Premier Web Solution back then while I was playing. I was building websites back in pre-2000. Uh, which were some of the first websites for companies um, that I was creating them for. And uh, from there, um, went to play on the indoor circuit, made a little bit more money professionally. But at some point, I think we had two kids at that point, my wife and I. And um, frankly, I needed to make more money and we traveled a lot. Um, And so we moved back to our hometown, Hagerstown, Maryland. Um, And from there, I just sort of, I guess I did both. I played soccer uh, in Baltimore, so I was able to, to commute, but also come back. Uh, to Hagerstown every day and started the business, um, or I used to say grew, grew pr- Premier Web Solutions to the point where we ended up selling it, worked for a company for a couple years, and then um, we ended up spinning out and uh, creating High Rock in 2005. And uh, High Rock's a marketing agency, as you mentioned, and then from there we got the itch to open our local cinema in 2010, and then the rest is history. We now have Warehouse Cinemas, three locations, and we still have High Rock as well, the agency. That's awesome. What, uh, what great experience. And I think just even your experience playing soccer for so long, like that's awesome. I think not too many people can say they've played uh, any sport at that level. 
Uh, so take your to so to take your experience there, and then you know an entrepreneur as well. You, you're a guy that likes to stay busy, I, I imagine. Yeah, and then to be clear, I, I consider myself an average professional uh, soccer player in the past. So uh, I, I just worked hard. They couldn't cut me because I just kept working in practice and won, won all the sprints <laughs> every practice. No, we can't, we can't let this guy go. So, um, but yeah, so I do get. Um, as an entrepreneur, I I, um, I like a challenge is, is the way I describe it, and um, you know certainly the cinema uh, uh, ventures for us have been a challenge, but um, but yeah, and I don't like to sit still. I'm an A type personality. Um, yeah, it's that that love for challenge and that hustle. I think probably translates pretty well to entrepreneurship. Uh, clearly. Well, let's talk about Warehouse Cinemas, um, which I'm totally repping today. Thank you for uh, sending yeah, us some thank that. you swag. Looks great. Yeah, looks great Had on to, you. That w looks yeah, great on you. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> color. It's a good color. It goes with our uh, EP orange too. So oh, that's right. It's, yeah. a, it's a good fit. But yeah, let's talk about Warehouse Cinemas. Um, how would you describe the company culture that you've developed there? Yeah, so I, I like how you mentioned at the beginning that culture is going to be created regardless if you steer it or not. It's going to show up. Um, and, and, you know, in, in, in business, I think we use the word culture. We throw it around a lot, especially the last five years. It's become that, that buzzword of, um, you know, good company culture, all those things. Um, what we've tried to... Um, tried to create at Warehouse Cinemas is a culture that is uh, a bunch of different things. And I'll just try to rattle off in my head what I believe it is. Um, Cause I think it often comes back to our core values, which we can talk about later as well, if you'd like, but please, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, at some level um, it is, it is hustle. It is hard work. We call the core value in that case is called climb the wall together. So our, our culture is one of, of really of, of hard work. I mean, we want to put in a solid uh, effort day in and day out. Um, but what's interesting about that is our last core uh, core value is called it just is just have fun. And so we, we we strategically place those at the beginning and the end because we also believe uh, I think professionals uh, need to figure out work life integration. Maybe maybe balance is a word that we've used as well. Um, but the integration of working really hard, loving what you do, coming to work every day because you enjoy it, and by the way, you're going to really put in the effort and think strategically all day, all those things. But then at the end of it, have fun. Um, and so for us, we try to look at uh, each team member, uh, whether it's on the corporate team uh, or on the management team or even the supervisors and even the hourly employees, um, really that, that they are both professionals and they're also people. And I think what that allows us to do is, is sort of think through the lens to make sure that we have an environment that is a safe place to work, um, that is positive, which is another core value, by the way. Uh, it's called embrace positivity. Um, we, we try to um, weed out, you know, n negativity at, at, at a large level, but also just no, um, no gossiping, things like that. We try to really stay out of the culture. Um, and, you know, not every day is a warm and sunny day. I mean, there's challenges, Friday night, busy cinema. I mean, it's not easy. So um, it's constantly looking at those things and making sure that we're offering an environment where people can um, enjoy working, excel, hopefully, and hopefully also opportunities for growth professionally. But then also on the personal side to make sure that they do go home um, and there's a level of integration there where they can actually spend time with the, with the people that they uh, they love most, honestly, because at the end of the day, um, that's really what's most important. I really like, and I do want to dig more into your values here in a moment, um, but I, I really like the way you worded work-life integration. Um, how does that look for you and your employees? You, you even mentioned when your employees, and we're talking about, you know, I'm sure everybody from the executive level through the frontline employees that are, you know, popping popcorn for you, um, you mentioned, you know, about them going home and, you know, those types of things. How did you come to that work-life integration? Why was that import, an important part of, you know, your values and the culture of the business? Yeah, I think, you know, I think gone are the days where you disappear from work and if we're honest about it. So to, 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 to the, the idea of if you're a general manager, let's just use it as an example, I mean, you're the tip of the spear for that location and it's busy and it's whatever, a Marvel movie weekend, right? Like like today, November 9th, <laughs> Marvel's is coming out with a Marvel movie. 
you know, to think that you turn off your phone and you completely disengage and you can't get, no one can get a hold of you is probably unrealistic, frankly. Um, especially if you're in a small business and a growing business, uh, maybe for larger companies, maybe in government work or whatever, like there's certain, certain scenarios where that works. But the idea of integration is making sure that you can, um, you can find that, 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 that balance, but you're, you're available, but you're not working, right? So you're available yeah. for emergencies, but you're not working and, and, and be willing to pick up the phone. Um, now if we abuse that, the, the integration side, and we call you every single night, then we're not doing our part as leadership management side, or frankly, we don't have the processes in place to allow you to have additional team members to carry the weight on site right yeah so um i think the integration piece is just it's really a recognition that we're salaried employees we we work a a range of hours we're not we're not we're not hourly you know start and stop and you know um and so that integration piece is just is even when you're home and we, we actually do some work from home days which is unique for i think a cinema yeah um and so we give that flexibility and we try to figure out that, that, that balance, but it's not, a, it's not an on or off switch. It's actually an integration is the way we, we approach it. I, I may have to start borrowing that language from you, if you don't mind, uh, because yep. we often hear, we say, uh, you know, we, we tell our, our staff, you know, life doesn't happen outside of nine to five and work doesn't always happen inside nine to five. And so we've got to provide that new evolved structure of work where there is that, you know, again, I, that's why I love this word that you're using integration, uh, because it's not necessarily balanced. Sometimes it ebbs and flows. It's, you know, we're integrating kind of the whole of the person. And I think, you know, we could probably go on for, for this whole episode just talking about that. But well, let, uh, well, let me add this to because you bring up a good point. It reminds me, I, but actually that culture piece if you if you work in a toxic culture, it's going to be hard for you to do this work life integration thing yes. around this piece, right? Yes. You want to get away from a from a toxic culture, people that you work with, you just don't get along with, all those things. If you have a culture that is hopefully positive most days, you enjoy going to work, you enjoy your coworkers, they all align the the DNA of your team aligns with the core values of your organization. Work-life integration is easier, so you almost have to have yes. the culture piece on its way, or, or you know, I've thought about it enough that you're implementing it and measuring it, which is we can talk about that as well, um, before you can actually do this thing called work-life integration. Because at the end of the day, you know, I think you 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 have to have one to have the other. I'm so glad you added that that note and clarification because you're absolutely right. You're not going to get that integration from employees that are disgruntled or feel like the company doesn't care about them. Um, and you know, they, and, and it does show up if they're aligned with the values and leadership is aligned with the values and it actually shows up in real life. Um, which is a perfect segue to, I do want to talk about warehouses company values. So would you mind just sharing your values and perhaps just a note about how or why you did, you landed on those? Yeah. So, um, we, went through the process of EOS, which we may touch on throughout the call today. So the entrepreneurial operating system, which as you know, Brett, we, we operate in and we've done for a few years now. And so we, you, you go through a process of discovering wh- what are those core values. And it's, it's honestly, it's about a four or five hour process of a, of a full day and core values is the first four hours. Um, so the, our first one is climb the wall together. So it's this idea of, um, of hard work, grit, uh, teamwork. We're, we're climbing the wall together as a team. Uh, the second one is embrace positivity. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good attitude. It's bringing the right energy. It's being intentional. Uh, the third one is do the right thing, which is obvious. It's the idea of integrity, um, uh, empathy, and I would say really authenticity is a word we use a lot. Um, take initiative is a big one for us. It's the idea that, that you're responsible, you're proactive, um, and you have effective communication. When you do take initiative, you also communicate effectively across the board. And then the last one, the fifth one is have fun. Um, it's just, it's, it's, we call it work hard, enjoy the ride. Um, you know, honestly, for the cinema side of the business, we, we showcase movies every week and I mean, it's fun. I mean, it's, 
it's it's not easy on Friday and Saturday nights when it's super busy and the popcorn machine breaks or whatever. But like um, all of those things, uh, it's it's honestly what we describe core values. Another way to say that is the DNA of the organization. We want to hire, fire, reward, promote all of those things around our core values. Um, and so it's not easy. And I'm not saying we get it right all the time for sure. Like it's always we're always a work in progress. But um, it's our North Star, honestly, the core value side of our business. It's it's so well put. Um, and those familiar with EOS, you know, that's going to resonate. And we'll talk more about EOS probably through the, throughout this conversation, just because, as you know, our company also operates uh, on EOS. And, and, you know, if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's worth looking up. But I'm sure Rich and I will talk a little more about it. Um, but what I love about, you know, what you're explaining is that and we we talk to our our clients about this often is that your company values are are that north star and really drive all business decisions you're hiring and firing based off of them you're making decisions based on do we innovate with this particular direction or do we pass on this opportunity and it all comes back to those values do you is that is that how warehouse operates as well yeah, the best way to, I mean, we have about 250 employees now and, and on, and everyone who, who hires on a site level or at the corporate level, um, it is the filter in which we do all the things when it comes to our human capital side of the business. Um, and, and if we do a good job at that, um, a lot of things frankly fall into place because we're bringing together people that ha- that are like-minded that believe in these things. And, you know, when it comes to things like do the right thing, I mean, that's sort of the, you know, I always joke that, you know, it's, that's who you are at your core. It's like the poster. That's like the Eagle flying. It says integrity on it or whatever. Yes. Right. Like, like we don't have posters around the break room or anything like that. That's it to have Eagles flying, but do the right thing is just like, if, if, if you're in high school or college or whatever, and you're coming and you're working part time, do the right thing. I mean, it's just like, you know, if someone gi- gives you cash, obviously you're going to ring it up af- appropriately and put it, put it away. But it's all, it's also all the really small things. Um, you know, we, 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 we have another one that's called our brand promise called save the day, which is sort of an extension of our core values and our save the day, uh, brand promise is just, we just do, we just do anything we can to like make the guest experience better. So do the right thing slash save the day is just, if that's baked into our DNA and everyone's thinking that way, honestly, I think it's a, it's a different way of operating, especially in the entertainment side of the, of, of an industry. Yeah, absolutely. Where, you know, I think unfortunately it gets a bad rap for, you know, doing the bare minimum and, you know, move along. Instead, you've, you've truly brought the values into your operations. And I think that's so significant because I know there's going to be listeners that hear this, that are perhaps working at a company or perhaps part of this uh, issue of a lot of companies will throw out company values and all they are is, is just words on a piece of paper. There's nothing about the way they integrate that into how they operate. Um, and, you know, you you all clearly have done that. And that's where you get the biggest impact and and the biggest difference. And that kind of leads into, you know, what I what I wanted to talk to you about next is what tangible business results are you experiencing with such a focus on these values and creating this strong company culture? Uh, it comes down to the people again. Uh, when we are successful at recruiting, hiring and retaining based on these core values. Like I said before, a lot of the stuff falls into place. So it's really expensive to have turnover, even even on your hourly employee side or part-time side, teaching someone how to use the POS or make popcorn or, or usher or go in the kitchen and do stuff. Like it's expensive. So the ROI probably haven't measured it exactly, but um, I mean, it's thousands of dollars to retrain someone. When you get to the management level, even the supervisor level, uh, in the cinemas, it, it gets even more expensive, and at the management level, even more expensive, and at the leadership level, even more expensive. So, um, really, if you look at your um, your labor costs across this a, a longer time period, there's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of savings if you actually retain people that believe in your core values. So that's the most obvious one for me. Um, and, and when we go through an interview process across the board, um, and we spend quite a bit of time on this, especially on the management side, and t- typically it's in both the second and the third interview when we're, when we're hiring for an assistant manager or a GM, 
is we actually go through our core values. And, and it, I often come into that, that third final interview, uh, you know, the finalists, one or two or three people, and I explain our core values and I, my, the inflection in my voice goes up because I, I believe in it in my core that, and then I want their take on it. I'm going I'm to tell you our core values and then I want you to respond to things that may have resonated. And honestly, it's one of the best ways to see if someone picks up on that because when they stumble and they don't know which one really connected with them or whatever, you start to say, I'm not sure that, you know, they have our core values. You know, you have to be careful specifically what questions to ask, but I let them just have an open-ended dialogue around, respond to what, what I just explained of their core values. And um, it's been helpful in that regard for sure. You can get that alignment immediately as you're interviewing. You can kind of gauge where they're at as far as that goes. And I think, you know, I really want to underline uh, what your points are around some of these business impacts. You know, to your point, turnover is very expensive. And especially in the cinema industry, it's just naturally been traditionally a higher turnover industry. We've got younger employees, but even even, you know, up the chain, it's just a higher turnover industry. And so what you're saying is because of this commitment to culture, this commitment to values, you've actually been able to save costs on and actually retain the right employees longer, um, you know, rather than I think some people retain employees, but are maybe they're not the right ones that they're that they're keeping around. But what you're saying is, you know, the difference this has made for you is you're able to retain, you know, talent that's aligned with the company because of these um, because of the way that you present the values and, and the way you present the culture. Um, yeah. And I'll just say, you know, we, we continue to work on it. So we're not, we're not by any means perfect. So there is a, there is a level, I would love retention to be even better than it is. Let's put it sure. that way. Sure. It, it's, it's been good over the years. Um, but man, you can't take your eye off of making sure you're taking care of your employees and creating that culture and making sure that you're uh, retaining in, in that regard, because um, it is very, very expensive. So yeah, um, yeah I will make sure what we're, <laughs> we're, not perfect at it, but we, we aspire to be great at, at it because we know that there is an ROI associated with it for sure. Yeah. You, you see where the benefits are. So you're, you're leaning into it. Yeah. What, and you talked about in, during the interview process, how you kind of really put the culture out there, put your values out there, engage that alignment. What other strategies do you employ to instill the warehouse culture and values for your new hires beyond just that, you know, what you do during the interview process? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing we like to do beyond the core value piece is we, we also want to just be upfront, uh, a level of authenticity around the future of our organization. Uh, we are planning to grow as an organization. So we typically in that third interview, I'm speaking to that because I'm normally in those third interviews, we will speak to the vision of the company. And I think, I think again, the, the, the inflection in, in my voice or in other leadership um, team members' vo voices is like, we are... We, we want to go places. Um, and so I think that that's helped recruit as well. Um, and honestly, I think what, what we're trying to do, and this impacts culture as well, is we're trying to always take a hard look at what we call our accountability chart. So another EOS term there. Um, our accountability chart to make sure that we have the, the right people in the right seats at the corporate level and the people the right people in the right seats at the each location level. Um, and then once we define that, we sort of have five bullets of their main, uh, their main role inside that seat, which again is part of that accountability chart diagram. But then I think the heavy lifting comes in when you, you map out uh, what truly is the roles and responsibilities of that role. Let's, call, let's say it's an assistant manager. Uh, we've really unpacked that and detailed it down to say, this is your role and this is what you'll be doing. So, you know, speak now if none of this fits because we don't have a name on this role yet. This is, this is, a, this is a function within the organization that we need to operate effectively. Um, and some of them are soft skills, some of them are hard skills, um, but we've done a good job, um, sp specifically Kristen Grove and our HR department of just un un unpacking those things so that essentially that, that interviewer knows what this role entails. There's no question about it. We talk about, you know, work-life integration. We talk about the number of hours 
um, obviously compensation, all of those things. But like, this is what you're going to be doing every day. And frankly, most of your life is spent at work. So do you enjoy doing this thing? Can you do the last core value, which is have fun? Um, and then I think what we also do is we, let's assume they are hired across the board. We then leverage that same uh, roles and responsibilities document to create what we call a competency model. And that's a, that's a deep dive probably for another conversation, but essentially the competency model is a, is a consistent uh, uh, visitation or review with that, that, that team member to make sure that they are doing the right things and have the skills to do the right things to be successful at those roles and responsibilities for, for, for that job. And, and the way I describe it as a sports analogy, whatever, is we want them to know what the scoreboard looks like and how, and how we're measuring success. And then if there are, if there are deficiencies or opportunities for improvement, um, we want to pour our guts into the, into the training side of that person to make sure that both professionally and personally uh, they can get to that level so that we're all um, not only being taken care of on, the, on, the, on that employee end, but also the business is being taken care of as well. So you put a lot of stake in right person, right seat, which like you said, is, is an EOS term, um, but it sounds like it starts from the beginning, right, is making it clear you've clearly defined roles, which I think is, is a takeaway that, that some organizations can take from this, because I think it is fair to say, you know, some job positions are like, you know, really lean hard on the other duty, other duties as a sign, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, here's a couple things we know you'll do, you know, but whatever else. And it sounds like you've got a really well-defined uh, accountability chart, which really is really job descriptions, you know, for, to kind of oversimplify it. Um, and, it sounds like with, you know, how you continue to support the employees, whether through training, et cetera, it's really all geared around ensuring the right people maintain, you know, stay in the right seat. And if they're missing a skill, you're finding opportunities to help them develop that. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest, I, in, in the past, we haven't done a great job of this. I mean, I've been in business for 16 plus years. We used to do what I think a lot of businesses might do, especially if you're, if you're a young business, is we would take the job description that we use to advertise the position and use that as the guide of what you're supposed to do when you show up from on the first day. It's not detailed enough and there aren't enough metrics in there to say what is success look like for this position. So it's, it's, and it's hard. You have to take sort of that overarching job description that you post on indeed and say we're looking for x manager or whatever it is and then you have to unpack that into more details that's almost like what's their true role and responsibility and then furthermore what is the competency needed to fulfill that role and to do that 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 job well and so i think that's what we've learned over the years is those three parts if you will coming together um and and, and to your last point i mean we really believe, and at the end of those reviews, not just having a number that says thumbs up, thumbs down, here's a number, see you in six months, right, well, for your next review, we actually set goals um, to make sure that if there are areas for improvement, whether it's a soft skill or a hard skill, we actually, we actually define that and say, what are we going to do in the next six months to get you better at that thing? Even if it costs money on our side, we, we want to, we want to invest in that piece of it. And your direct report is going to hold you accountable for doing those things month over month over month. So when we, when we show up in six months for your next review, we can say, did, did we accomplish our goals to work on these things? Yes or no. And if not, it's probably going to be a, you know, a, a tougher conversation in that review because we, we, we offer the resources, hopefully, right, that, that allowed them. And if, the, if it wasn't executed, then honestly, that, that we may have different issues because we, we want people to grow in their roles and we're willing to invest in that. Right, right. So you're, you're, you're really looking at this competency level, defining what it really needs to be very clearly. And then one important piece that I don't want to get lost in everything else that we're talking about is you're measuring this stuff you've got metrics for for performance and it's not just a you know uh, it drives me nuts these companies that have like an annual review and that's all they have for performance development right you've got an ongoing review with the direct report are, are you on track off track you know with these specific responsibilities that we're clear on and if you're struggling we're going to help you we're going to invest you know soft skills hard skills whatever it is you're but we have a scorecard um, we have a measurement, a way to track your performance that's clearly defined. 
I mean, that's got to, and, and I, I'm, I'm loading the deck here for us because, uh, you know, we, we both operate in an EOS, but, you know, for employees, it really helps take the mystery out of, am I doing a good job? Because it's right there for everybody, right? Yeah, and, and you mentioned scorecard. I mean, it's it's that that semi-annual review every six months. There's a, there's a process where um, the team member will um, uh, evaluate themselves. Their manager will, will evaluate them. And then in some days, and sometimes, in some cases, we'll have a colleague also do it. So you have a 360 assessment of that person. So, yeah, at the end of the day, it spits out a bunch of numbers and it says, this is where you need to be from a competency perspective. Let's say it's a three, you're coming in at a two on average across all these scores. Let's dig into that for a minute. And I think we may have an opportunity for growth. It's not, you're doing a bad job conversation. It's there's an opportunity for growth conversation. And then you dig into that. So that's, that's one scorecard. But what I didn't say yet was all of those things that have to do with their competency are also baked into our pay for performance system which is essentially a, a individual scorecard per person on the management side where they turn in a monthly scorecard that aligns with those same competency models validated by, by the direct report. But that kicks out a number that ultimately is a, is, is a formula for, for getting pay for performance or mm. uh, in other ways, pr- uh, profit sharing. And if you're 100% across the board, you'll get 100% of your your opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. If you land at 70 or 80% because your scorecard, you know, you, you didn't do it X, Y, and Z, then it's going to be less than that. So the full potential is always the opportunity for that pay for performance. So that's even a more granular. Um, and also, I, you know, just to give Kristen Grove credit for this as well, because, <laughs> um, you know, she manages all of this and it's, it's a lot to manage, but it's, it's that scorecard as well that's self-reported by, by, by the team member that ultimately um, becomes a, a performance bonus on their check once a month. And there's no mystery behind it. It's no. you're communicating clearly what the expectation is, how to get there. And, and what happens if you do, what happens if you don't? Um, yeah, shout out to Kristen. Uh, we all love Kristen. <laughs> what, so I guess that's another good segue. Uh, you know, we've talked a bit about, you know, the role that leadership plays uh, in upholding company values, just in some of the things you do, you come in with, you talk about some of the things that are uh, direct reports are responsible for. Your company also does a really great job with leadership development and a leadership development program. How does that play into upholding the company values and maintaining a strong company culture? Can you, can you speak to that program a bit? Yeah. I mean, especially as a growing company, like I said earlier, like, like I, I will only scale to the, uh, at the same pace at, at which we're willing to invest in leadership. So it's, 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 it's leadership. And then we scale, not like, scale because, you know, Greg and I have great ideas or find a great location or whatever it is. And so I think that's, that's been key to us is the investment on the leadership side, because leadership is not management. And so we, we separate those two worlds and that management um, is, is is doing the, the job. Well, leadership is influencing people that, 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 that you're, that you're leading. Right. Yes. And so when, when it comes to those, again, I always say for these Friday nights, Saturday nights where it's super busy, leadership is the moment when you pull someone aside and you give them a, you know, in private, a, 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 a um, you know, opportunity for growth conversation versus you, 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 you correct them in public type thing. Right. So that's the art of sort of getting that person to a higher level performance wise. And so there's that art side of leadership. So we, across the board for all our managers, we have what we call a leadership learning path. Um, and it's, it's a 12 month program where they go through and it's part management, part leadership, but there's, there's different, um, uh, books they read and things like that. Um, that, that 12 month curriculum is something that we put all managers through. Um, and then we're, we're doing the same thing now for supervisors. We're putting them through their own, um, uh, LLP, um, and so, uh, and then on the, on the general manager side, you know, we've recently 
really spend some time thinking about how do we get the general manager to even a, a higher level from a leadership perspective because they are you know some of our busy our, our busier locations i mean it's there's a lot of people that work there and there's a lot of revenue that flows through there and and and, and a lot of people that that person manages we want them to get to another level of leadership so we've uh, recently uh, invested uh, actually quite a bit of money and resources on 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 professional coaches uh, to help each individual general manager not a group session there are sort of group sessions but mostly it's the general managers with a one-on-one -on -one professional coach specific on the ideas of leadership because wow. the other part of it is all the in our case the general managers they're all different they all have their own backgrounds um, so that 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 leadership uh, professional coach really helps them on a one on one basis get to that next level based on our core values, based on all the stuff we're already doing. They're basically taking the competency model and just making sure on a one on one basis that they're going to execute that and, and, and frankly, be better as leaders. And if yeah. we do that, I think to your point earlier about the ROI side of it, our general managers as better leaders calls calls us at, at corporate to do less of the day-to-day, -day, if you will, yeah. focus on growing the business. And that and that's back to the scale concept. That's how you get to scaling is, yeah. is putting these people in that position. I, I love how proactive you all are with this. Um, I've, and you may have heard me use these terms before, but you know, we always talk about the difference between a manager and title and a true organizational leader or contributor. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is really elevating that. And I think, you know, you're the exception to a lot of other organizations where, you know, somebody has been around for a while, you don't want to lose them, you push them up into a management position, but then it's kind of like, you're, they're lucky if they get the, you know, training to even just manage a small team, let alone elevate them to this level of being, you know, this level of leadership you're talking about is what we consider organizational contributors, right? They have a sense of ownership within the company. You know, not literal equity always, right? But just this yeah. sense of I'm not just a manager, I'm a true leader. And and I loved your example earlier about the difference between a manager and title and a true leader is somebody who would need to give perhaps some constructive feedback and they take that person aside in a private room and deliver that constructively versus a manager without those soft skills might just be like, hey, what are you doing? You know, don't do it this way in front of everybody, right? It's a minor example, but I like to use that one because that's one of those differences between an actual leader and just somebody who has the title of manager. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I just think other companies don't do quite enough there. And that's where, you know, um, I guess shameless plug for us, but that's where our advanced management program came from mm -hmm. was hearing so many companies having so much trouble at that management level. And it was really realizing that these managers haven't been retooled. Um, so right. another analogy you've probably heard me use before is just like, it's like having a services company and sending your, you know, electrician out, uh, uh with, with a plunger and your plumber out with a voltage meter, right mm -hmm. They're They don't have the tools for the job. And so it, what you're doing is helping to elevate and give them those tools. And I mean, you're taking it a whole step beyond by investing in coaching. And I mean, that's amazing, but to your point, that's going to get your company to be able to scale. It's not just like this selfish one-off, hey, here's a random benefit. There's strategy behind it. And you see the benefits in investing in that growth. Well, yeah, and and the way I've learned to look at it uh, with some some years under my belt, I guess, and maturity is, um, you know, it's not their fault. Like I, I like when we when we're when we're complaining about some performance issue somewhere, it's like I almost stop, go 20,000 foot view and go, wait, let's look at that individual's background for a second. They've never been taught these things. So if, if we do that and then we go, okay, now let's come back down and say, okay, let's stop complaining, stop trying to tactically fix it with more reports or more meetings or whatever. And we say, it's actually fundamentally, do, do we agree that it's a leadership issue? Yes. Okay. Now what are we going to do about it? Are we going to, are we going to do what we say we're going to do, which is invest? Or are we going to continue to keep complaining about it and hope, hope the performance changes? So I think s small business owners oftentimes, if we just stop and say it's actually not their fault that they're not doing these things well, they've never been trained. And it's, it's up to the, it. the, to the business owner to say now we have to decide if we're going to train them or not. Because if you don't train them, then stop complaining right? Yeah. Because yeah. they're not going to get any better. They're not, 
on their own, they're probably not going to get any, but left to their own devices, they're probably not going to get much yep. better at what they're doing. Yeah. There, so. There's always an exception of somebody who's extremely motivated and they're reading, you know, motivational content and suddenly yeah. they surprise you, but yeah. you're, it's so perfectly put what you said. It's, you know, when you're not doing those things, you're, you're handing that plunger to your electrician and you're saying, go for it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then you're wondering why they're not doing a good job. Yeah. Um, well, so, they come yeah. back and they say, I didn't, I didn't f fix the, 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 the toilet, what, what, right. you know, well, right. why not? You need to fix the toilet. Right. <laughs> it's like, well, what, you gave, you gave me a voltage meter. What do you want me to do? You a voltage reader. Like I, <laughs> it's like, it's a, you can still try to use the voltage reader to un unclog the toilet. Right. I mean, it's like, it's a really weird example, but like, I know, I know <laughs> we could take it that far. I know I gotta, I gotta come up with a new analogy cause I've been using that one for a bit, but it, yeah. it, it seems to fit, right. It's all, it's, it's about retooling. And I just love your point in taking that responsibility as the business of this isn't them. It's, did we give them the tools to succeed mm. in that position? Mm. And I think asking that question is really important. Yeah. What, what have been the biggest challenge? Because I think everything we're talking about, you know, we're almost making it sound easy. Uh, what, you know, what have been the biggest challenges to maintaining your company culture and how have you addressed those as you've, have you, as you've continued to grow? Yeah, uh, two things come to mind. One, uh, culture is extremely fragile. Um, it can turn on, a, in my experience at least, it, it can turn on a dime and go yes. south fast. Um, so what we've tried to do, and I have all these like sub brands, I feel like I'm throwing out here, but like, um, we, we do, let's just call it surveys. We actually call it something, we call it a culture pulse at the, at the corporate level. Mm -hmm. Um, and we do surveys to, to ensure that people, you know, anonymously are giving us feedback to make sure that our culture is healthy. It's a, it's a good, safe, positive environment to work in. Um, one of the things that we've done recently, which, which we came to, we had a, a good survey went out, we got some information back, but it wasn't at the level that we feel like it was a, a valid, um, statistic because there weren't enough people responding that we actually just sent out a separate one via text to all the employees and said, how likely are you to recommend warehouse cinemas to your friends to come work here? Yes or no? And so it was just one question and we got a lot of feedback from that. And, you know, we're working through sort of that tool as well. And so it's, it's, it's surveys to ensure it. And then honestly, on-site visits is a big deal. You, you can feel culture when it's not there. Um, we haven't even talked about the culture and how that's uh, experienced by the end consumer who's coming to watch a movie. A, a healthy culture spilling out into the, auditor in, into the lobby when you're serving someone, just you can't fake that. Um, and so, um, on-site visits also help where you're sort of measuring, you know, at some level, the, the smiling faces and, and interactions with, with employees and guests. Um, but honestly, that survey tool is something that we've really, we do per periodically just to make sure that the culture is truly aligned with our core values. And if not, especially on a per location basis, we can go in and say, Hey, we're seeing a dip here. What's going on? Any thoughts, you know, and try to dig into the, the, the root cause of that. Once again, additional opportunities for measurement and tracking, um, that you all are doing that to kind of get the truth of your situation, um, which I really like. The other thing you had said, I think that's a, that's a great point. We haven't really talked about this. How does company culture impact the guest or customer experience at a company? I mean, the way I describe it is I want warehouse cinemas to have a soul. Like I want, when you come into warehouse cinemas, you're like, I don't know why it just feels different. And I think, um, I think that's the benefit to the consumer when they come up, there's other things like a what they call a proven process in EOS, um, where we have sort of a the 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 minute we interact with the customer to the minute they walk out the door, um, what what does that experience look like on one page? Um, you know, you can do those th those tools and you can put that poster up in the employee lounge, but at the end of the day, it goes back I think to that authenticity. I think if 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 culture is healthy, people are, are enjoying their work. You just know it as a consumer and you're like, I feel like they just don't want my money. I feel like 
they're inviting me into this space to have a communal experience in an auditorium watching a movie. And then they're saying goodbye to me when I leave, you know, and I had a great drink and I had a great food. You know, it's all those things coming together. But the authenticity, I think, is what comes out uh, from from a, a healthy culture. And that authentic- authenticity doesn't come without the extra support that we've spent this whole time talking about in terms of how you ensure that 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 authenticity gets down to that frontline employee to then provide that to the guest. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, it's not, not to talk about process here because I know we're getting short on time, but like, you know, we, we can, you, you can process and standard operating procedure and all those things all day long, but we try to create those documents for sure and, ha- and have those for, for purposes of scale and to make sure that each location is, is being consistent with all those things. But we try to talk about frameworks as opposed to, you know, everything is an if then statement and you have to, you're mm-hmm. like a robot. You know, I think so the framework allow allow the team, assuming that the, the culture is healthy, allow the team to humanize um, the experience for the guest. And in the background, there's this operation that happens where you get your food in, in less than six minutes because that's that's our that's our goal. Right. Right. Um, but when that person hands it over to them, they look the other person in the eye and say, enjoy your movie. Um, you know, the shame on Brie grilled cheese is my favorite, too. Right. Because yeah. it probably is their favorite grilled cheese, and that's what they got. And um, so, yeah, it's 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 all those things that just happen like, naturally. It's 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 it's. I think it's an X factor of of where our cinema is and how we want to continue to grow. But yeah. but it, it, it frankly it gets hard at scale, right? Location uh, four, five, and six for us or, or beyond. We have to keep working on this thing to make sure that that soul remains in each location not just something corporate's pushing down as an SOP. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I, and I love how you put this really goes beyond, I mean, SOPs are critical, but this takes it beyond SOPs because that's a bit robotic and that's what SOPs are meant to be. But this humanizes that um, quite a bit. What Rich, what advice would you give to other business leaders, regardless of industry that are trying to either repair their culture or build or, or improve on their their existing company culture within their organization <clears throat> yeah that's a tough one um I, I think the first thing is is the honest truth the, the brutal facts of the matter there's probably a survey that goes out that at, and a survey not that leads them down a path you want them to answer and, and have the results like <laughs> so but like we're really a um a, a statistically uh, valid survey that says, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? And then get the results. And from there you go, oh my goodness, we're actually maybe on a per location basis, but even corporately, uh, we're missing the mark in these things. And I think I think, you, I think you create those surveys based on what we've already talked about. That it's, it's the core value side of it. Like if, if you truly have core values and you wanna live them, then you create the the survey based on that, and that's the first step is just to get the brutal facts in, see where you where you rank. Uh, there's professional companies we've looked into doing them here and there uh, that do those surveys for you. Um, there's a whole process of getting the feedback. There's even in-person meetings with top management um, to really uncover the hard truth and lay that report on the CEO's desk and say, "This is what everyone's saying about your company, and you have issues." <laughs> Yes. And so, I mean, that to me is the first step. And then from there you go, okay, well, let's, let's start to honestly and authentically address some of these issues. And you start to roll that out, which is probably another podcast. And and I'm I'm probably not the expert on that anyway. So, um, but no, I would say it's, it's hard. It's, it's, if you have a culture that's that way, you really have to get to the place where you're willing to take, uh, take the the survey results <laughs> yeah and uh, take them to heart and, and and go from there I think, I, I think it's an aha moment for for CEOs or business owners in that regard yeah I, I couldn't agree more and we've we've seen it we've done some of that pre-work some of that kind of survey work to and and brought it back to the executive suite and there's this moment of kind of deflation but also rec- like there's also this recognition of I knew this, right? Yeah, like right. it's never, it's never shocking. It's, yeah. it's, it's always like, I'm disappointed that this is now confirmed that, yeah. you know, I was worried that this was the case and now it's confirmed, but then it's, so it's about, I, I love that. It's 
that's where you have to start. You have to start by looking the truth in the face and then yeah. you can take action. Yeah. And I'm just thinking out loud. I, I, I almost feel like it's better to have an outside firm do that for you because anyone internally is going to have a bias going for sure. into that. So um, that'd be my suggestion is to get a professional to come in and do that. I mean, they, they are out there. I mean, culture is a thing over the last 10 years and there are companies that do just that. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, th this has been incredibly uh, enjoyable, Rich, and, and very valuable uh, with everything you've been sharing. It, it, I always like to ask at the end, is there anything that I didn't give you the chance to speak about on this topic that you want to share, That anything that we've left out? No, I'm not even sure what I talked about. I, I figure I was just <laughs> brainstorming with you. Um, That's what we do. I like it. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, I don't know, just for, I guess I would speak to the CEO or business owner or entrepreneur that, um, you know, this stuff we've been talking about is something that it's taken us years to get to the place where we're, I would say, pointed in the right direction. I, it seems like we're executing it flawlessly and we're probably not, frankly. Um, but I think the the effort associated with that and the way we talk about it um uh, and I'll give you an example that maybe maybe will um, be a bit of advice, and that is um, we have a, a thing called a rock party. So so uh, we haven't used EOS terms too much, but that's another one called a rock. <laughs> uh, a rock is essentially a 90-day strategic objective, and we have those at the corporate level, we have those at each location level. Well, the rock party, as we grow, we, we get everyone together either virtually or in person, and we talk about everyone's rocks, the rocks from the previous uh, quarter or the strategic objectives from the cre uh, previous quarter and the ones going forward, just, to, just so everyone knows what's going on around the organization. And what's interesting about that is, is, is uh, oftentimes, well, not oftentimes, every time, uh, Greg and I, our COO and, and, and partner, will just at the end of about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, we call it Ask, ask Us Anything. And so they've, we've talked about strategic objectives and that's all great. We're all going to do this stuff and we're going to be successful at, at executing this thing. But now what questions do you have for us? And we'll answer, you know, as much as we can, you know, there's some, something proprietary like locations and NDAs and stuff like that. But like, like ask us. And a lot of times it's like this dialogue for like 30 or 45 minutes. And I say all that to say, I think that speaks to culture because you have, um, sort of the transparency and authenticity of the of the owners who we don't go on site as often as our district managers or our, even our our, uh, our hr person and so it gives them an opportunity and then we just say yeah this is what we're doing we passed on this location we passed on that location we are looking to grow we're funded for this amount of you know and at, at that that 30 minutes is probably more every 90 days that, that they're like, oh, you know what? Like it reminded me why I work for this company, I think is, is what it does. Yes. Yes. But also the, the, the owners are saying um, what, what you're hearing from your direct reports is what we believe. So the DNA that we have as owners is the same DNA that, that's in the core values and hopefully you as, as team members um, have as well. So, um, and we joke and have fun too at the, at the same thing. So I make fun of Greg and those in those presentations and he makes fun of me and everyone laughs. And so, you know, we're climbing, we're hard work and whatever, but we're having fun at the same time, even in the right. rock parties. So, right. You're, um, you're, you're keeping it in front of everybody, bringing it down to a real level and also giving them the opportunity for input, you know, whether that's done through surveys or through a rock party, I think that's a really key takeaway uh, for, for organizations is you got to listen to your people, you know, you got to listen to them and you got to have that open dialogue. Yeah. Um, I love that. Well, th this, Rich, this is the part uh, of the show where, uh, you know, as a, as a thank you to you for spending time with me, I like to pause, just give you a few moments to plug whatever is most important to you right, right now. It could be a company, nonprofit initiative, idea, whatever it is, the floor is yours. Uh, I don't really have much to plug. Uh, I mean, warehousecinemas.com if you want to find out more about Warehouse Cinemas. Um, I would say follow us on LinkedIn, connect LinkedIn. I'm at Rich Daltridge. Um, yeah, I mean, the plug is just, uh, I mean, we have a blast doing what we're doing. Um, you know, it's hard. I mean, the writer's strike is, is, has been happening for X amount of months, whatever, but you're always going to have those headwinds. But um, no, I think, I think the plug is we're looking to grow. Um, 
we're looking to expand, but we're also very disciplined on our growth plans. We, we only want locations that really make sense for our model. Um, so if, if there's real estate investors listening, then call us. We'll get, call <laughs> Rich up. the plug you're looking for. <laughs> um, or real estate developers, I should say. So, um, yeah, and honestly, we just we work hard every day uh, on the stuff we talked about. But it's not easy, I guess, is my parting advice. It's it's hard stuff. It's headspace. It's and you have to really commit to it. Um, but once you do, I think I think what what people will often say is that when they go to a warehouse cinemas, they, like I said before, it just it feels different. They can't really explain why. I think it has a lot to do with the culture and the investment, both you know, time and money we put into it. And uh, I think it pays dividends. So. Absolutely. I love that. So that's a great place to a uh, great place to start wrapping it up. I think that's, that's excellent advice uh, to leave people with rich. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to, to talk with me today. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you as it always is. Uh, I feel like we could have, you know, probably gone a whole other hour. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm forcing us to cut it off, but I, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, couple of quick takeaways that I'll just summarize uh, real quick that, you know, probably don't do justice quite to the the entire episode. But, you know, a couple of key things that that I just sort of jotted down that I think our audience might take some stuff away from is your company values should not just be random things on a piece of paper that you put out there. Your company values really need to be something that everything is then derived from your business decisions, your hiring, your firing. You know, these are to be taken really seriously and and put intention behind them. Um, two, getting the right people in the right seats, another EOS term, uh, but, you know, people that align with those company values. Um, and and this, this recap is all about how do you create a strong culture, right? So right people, right seat. Who's aligned with those company values? We want to make sure that's there. But then we want to support and measure the growth of our people. So the measurement comes into, you know, uh, as Rich talked about, they have very clear descriptions of this is your responsibility. This is what you're you're being held accountable to. So we're measuring performance, but then we're also supporting our people and their growth. If they're missing that, you know, missing that mark, perhaps we're not just, you know, throwing that under the rug. We're giving them opportunities for growth. Um, and then finally, listening to our people, gathering feedback, whether it's through surveys or whether it's through rock parties that, uh, you know, warehouse uh, throws, uh, again, EOS term, uh, but, you know, whatever it is, it's it's creating that two-way communication. So you're not just pushing messages out to your people, but you're hearing from them. And I think if we can take some of those key points and apply them in our organizations, we're going to build a much stronger company culture. So I want to thank Rich again for joining us today. I want to thank our listeners and viewers for tuning in. Don't forget to please like and subscribe if you are getting value from this content on the Exploring Potential podcast. You can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Please do give us a rating and a review while you're there. And just a reminder, you can also watch, like, and subscribe on YouTube. Go ahead and visit exploringpotential.com for more information about our team and the work that we do. And thank you all very much. We'll see you on the next one.